put him behind the wheel and Peter Brock plays to win. In almost 30 years in motor racing, he's had a near-perfect run. Now at 52, Brocky is gearing up for a big finish. You please. 12. When you get behind the wheel of the car, the actual exercise of getting behind the wheel of the car and make it do something it fundamentally doesn't want to do. You know, you're trying to break late into a corner and you slide it through and you're doing all those sorts of things. That's a fantastic thing for any person to do it. The other side of it, of course, is that uh, you, you've, you've done that enough in your life to have fulfilled any desires to say, well, can I do it or can I not do it? If you've done it, you say, well, OK, let's move on to the new challenges. The sport is losing not just a champion, but a legend. Thank you very much. Excuse me, please. Let me get in chain, then we will sign autographs if we have time. As Paul Weissel from the Holden Racing Team knows only too well, the public just can't get enough of Peter Brock. Thanks, folks. Please let us go. Please let us go. We've got three generations of Peter Brock fans. That, uh, that are up there and now you've got mothers, fathers, daughters, grandfathers, granddaughters all in that uh, autograph from Brock. Please, 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 please. Please, folks. About he crosses the bounds. People say, oh, yes, we know Peter Brock. Not necessarily from motorsport, but they know him, the person. They know he's always got a friendly face. He smiles, he's nice to people. Never says no to people, which is a drawback for everybody else in the team. I better get the car. Come on, please, folks. Okay. We're getting changed, thank you. I'll get changed and uh, we'll catch up later on. Thanks, folks. Have a good day, Peter. Cheers, mate. Oh. At work, Peter Brock might be immersed in high octane fumes and high decibels, but at home on the outskirts of Melbourne, it's a very different story. The speed freak is also a new age, environmentally aware vegetarian who paints. I have to say, Peter, this is a long way from the racetrack. It is. But I've always enjoyed a bit of art, a bit of sketching, popping a bit of paint on these, paint on the paper. I mean, it, I, I'm a bit too structured sometimes, so I like to, it's nice and free to do it. Moments like this is when you stop your brain working and just relax and just enjoy uh, just being on the planet, I guess. At the start of his career, Peter Brock probably better fitted the image of the fast living racing car driver. This week's Mirror reveal Peter Brock's attempt to change the situation. He admits he was a maniac himself, but now he's into class driving. His former publicist, Tim Pemberton, recalls those days. Oh, well, I think he was a, a product of the age. There was a bit of Warren, women and song around the place. Um, it's fair enough. <laughs> That's the way it was. And um, Peter was out there. Motoring writer and sometime Brock co-driver Peter McKay was there too. Yeah, there was a wild time. Like, Peter got into the sport when he was in his uh, early 20s. And guys in their early 20s have a good time. And uh, he certainly did. And... He kept those early 20s going until he was well into his 30s. What are we talking about? Serious boozing, women? Women. Oh, yeah. Just a shocker. He loved them and they loved him. Of course, yeah. Yeah, he's... Uh, I'm glad to confirm that Peter's heterosexual and uh, <laughs> he was out there. Yeah, sure. Back in those heady days, you went through a pretty... Wild stage, would that be fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, look, I've always loved life and I've always lived life to its fullest extent. And if I've seen something out there to do and I've felt the sl slightest inkling I should do it, I've just turned around and done it. OK. Don't let Mum see you do this. There you go. Teaching them rotten habits. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. 
Everyone who knows Peter Brock will tell you that the person who put him back on track is longtime partner Bev, the then science teacher he met back in the 1970s. Bev's influence has been far more than uh, has ever been recognised by anyone. And Bev um, has got a, uh, an understanding of life and a, uh, I guess a, an ability to forgive, to be considerate, to be compassionate, all those things, which is uh, rather extraordinary. So I would say that I'm a very fortunate person to have run across Bev in my life. How different is he to the bloke you met a few <laughs> years back? Very different, totally different person. Absolutely and completely different. He was very intense, very demanding, total perfectionist, you know, extremely difficult to keep up with on a day-to-day -day basis. And you look at him now and you think, wow, he's just, you know, sort of gentle and calm and, and yeah, it's, it's, but it's taken a lot of experience, a lot of <laughs> events to have happen until he's reached this stage. And Peter Brock not getting away any more quickly than the Falcons. There he is in picture there, Brock. Well, there are a number of things that you look at that were major moments in your life. Winning Bathurst for the first time. Well, it's a bit strange to be standing up now after six and a half hours running around in the uh, old Tirana, but, well, I can't believe it's all over. Winning by six laps in 1979. Comes across to take the chequered flag for the Peter Brock. He's done it. Winning it against uh, enormous levels of adversity in 1987. Probably the toughest physical thing I've ever done was uh, to win the Round Australia Reliability Trial in 1979. 20 odd thousand kilometres, 11,000 of that was competitive. 14 days, I was not a rally driver. It was a real challenge for me. And I was just dreaming about dodging kangaroos for weeks later, I can tell you in the middle of, because I got something like 30 hours sleep in 14 days. It was just full on. Into Kernamona at lunchtime, having done 600 kilometres in the morning from Adelaide, Peter Brock first in. It wasn't in the script because he wasn't a, a rally driver, he's a circuit driver. Plus he was up against the world's best in other makes of cars and he won and he won easily and I know that to this day he regards that as his best performance ever. At the finish, winner's laurels to Peter Brock, victorious over some of the best opposition and the worst terrain in the world. World Rally, none other than Peter Brock. Ultimately, the event that changed Peter Brock more than anything was not one of his many successes, but a failure. It was 1987 and Brock was promoting this new age device called the Energy Polarizer. Makes uh, motor vehicles work a lot better in all respects. Peter claimed simply slipping this box of crystals and magnets under the bonnet would make a car run better and wanted to include it in the Holden Brock Commodore. General Motors slammed on the brakes. There were many concerns accompanying claims, but the one which brought the issue to a head was the energy polarizer. Holden says it had no choice but to sever the relationship. Well, I was pretty naive, and I just sort of guess I thought, oh well, I know this is so, therefore the rest of the world must know it's so. And I just tried to impose my will upon others, I suppose, which is always a great mistake to, to make. A certain level of arrogance in doing that. You still believe you were right though, don't you? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, you, you know when you're onto something and, uh, you know, that particular principle is now used very successfully in a number of um, appliances which people buy, uh, use around their homes, such as uh, water purifiers and things like that. But, you know, that was 10 years ago and, well, you know what they say about pioneers. <laughs> they get eaten by the natives. <laughs> the polarizer destroyed his business, there's no doubt about that. Motoring writer Peter McKay says Brock gained a lot from what seemed a disaster. I look at Peter today and I see a better guy than I saw pre-polarizer. And I'm no advocate of the polarizer. I, I thought it was mumbo jumbo, I still do. But I think the things that, are, that came out of that, that inward looking time really worked very well for Peter. Peter 
Rock's final challenge on the racetrack is to drive his way to a fairy tale ending, a 10th Bathurst win. But the big question is, which one? In a Super League style split, this year there will be two races, one for the V8s and one for the touring cars. The King of the Mountain will compete in both. It's a situation that, uh, to a large degree, has, uh, I suppose, encouraged me to come to a decision to uh, retire. It's uh, messing around with something which is, uh, you know, it's a very delicate thing, Bathurst. It's an entity. It's, it's something which has been developed over a period of 30, 35 years. And uh, the, uh, the way, the mystique, the, uh, the, the intrigue, it, the way it's held in the hearts of uh, people of Australia, of course, is very special. Here he comes, listen to the applause, the accolades for a man among men when it comes to race car drivers, still tidy. You're going to be feeling a little bit tight in the throat the last time you go down that straight, do you yeah. think? Yeah, I think I am. Yeah. I think I'll probably be like some kid and just sort of crack up because uh, the realisation hasn't hit me at this point in time. And Brock has done it again. At Mount Panorama. Next year, no Brock. And uh, it's like the headliners heading off into the sunset. And I don't really know what motorsport's going to do to replace him. Peter Brock, winner of the great race. Are you excited? Very much so. This is, a, this is the start of probably the most, well, not probably, definitely the most important phase of my life. The man who has conquered the mountain. I think the mayor of the city, I'd even call this, Mount Brock.